We're taking you to breakfast with Vinny and Mike. Every morning at this time, KMPC invites you to share the breakfast chat of those two famous personalities, movie star Vinny Barnes and her husband, film producer, sports announcer and authority, Mike Frankovich. There are three children, the household staff, the dog, the two birds, and anyone else who happens to drop in. We now switch you to the Beverly Hills home of Mr. and Mrs. Mike Frankovich for breakfast with Vinny and Mike. Oh, what a lovely... How's the weather this morning, Aileen? It's nice, madame. Oh, greetings, darling. And I'm so happy to see that you're out of the bathroom, so... Oh, now, baby, you know I always get out in time for coffee. Well, I hope it tastes as good as it smells this morning. Well, it definitely does. You know, something going on that switch. And I find that Hill's water is practically the best that there is on the market. I think you'll agree with me when you taste it. Well, I'm going to taste it right now, and I'll let you know. Just a moment. Hey, I think you're right. It's swell, and it certainly sets me up this morning, and, brother, do I need it. Well, I'm glad something sets you up, dear. Say, uh, what were you pussyfooting in about uh, 12.30 last night for? I wasn't pussyfooting, dear. I came in with my shoes on, and the reason it was 12.30 is because I was in a bridge game with Chico Marx and George Raft and Alex Kempner. Oh. And I played. I was a dollar winner, a dollar loser, until about 11.15. And then the last rubber lasted about a solid hour. And I had Chico Marx for a partner. And it looked like I was going to come out all right last night until our opponents bid six hearts. Michelle, put your hands up to your mouth when you're coughing like that, will you please? I did before. All right, dear. Thank you. And with the opponents bidding six hearts, I led the queen of clubs with three cards left in our hands, and I knew that it was going to be a good trick. Mm-hmm. But Chico, who is one of the best bridge players in town, went ahead and trumped my good queen. Well, oh. you imagine how I felt. And, of course, they made their small slam, and we argued about it for 20 minutes. You know how the boys go on. And... I've never heard a man with so many excuses, but that's all I do. You always have a very good one, I must no say. excuse, believe me. All right. Well, you know what the astrologer says today, dear? No, I wish they were better than they are. I hope they're better than they were yesterday for me in that bridge game. Go ahead, Mrs. Zodiac. Now, listen, dear. I worked it all out beautifully last night, and today is Mercury. And that means that it's a very fine day for signing contracts and doing business and to be have, well, to have a lot of fun oh, and be very gay. Oh, you and your astrology all the time. I suppose you're going to tell me that everything is governed by astrology. Oh. Makes me laugh. <laughs> now, listen, dear. You may, this may surprise you very much indeed. You talk about astrology, but I had a thought yesterday that it would be very nice to give the children ice cream. So do you know what I did? No, what did you do? I went to the May Company on Wilshire Boulevard, and believe it or not, dear, they have a freezer. Now, listen, this is simply divine. They have a freezer that you can go to the table... And you make in, in, in uh, oh, I think something like nine seconds, ice cream. At the table, imagine that. Not nine seconds. You must have read the ad wrong. It oh, probably 90 was 90 seconds. seconds. That's, That's what better. it is. Well, you know, I never read well, anything. Well, I kind of like ice cream. How about you, Michael? Would you like some ice cream? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so uh, did I. you ever see their, their store on Wilshire Boulevard? What store? The appliance store that the May Company has. Oh, the May Company. You mean the one down near Fairfax? That's Can right. Can I have it's... some ice cream? You yes. what? You see? Now, that's why we should get a freezer. You hear that? That's what your children like. They want ice cream, Daddy. You that's hear right. it all the time. Well, I'm going to have to drop into that make company and take a look at that place. Incidentally, I understand there are a lot of nice appliances in that store. There certainly are. So, yeah, how about the game? Yeah, how about the game? Shall I go on to that football game or shall I keep talking about appliances? No. Now, everybody in town has asked me for tickets. And this is the big game, USC, UCLA. And these tickets are worth a lot of money. They only sell for five dollars, but I venture to say, if I were a scalper, which I am not, of course, uh-huh. I could sell it for twenty or twenty-five dollars. Well, However, I have a ticket for you. Now, are you going or are you not going? You mean I can really get five dollars for the ticket? No, you can get the seat at the game, and if you're not going, I'll take one of the boys. Which boys are you going to take? Well, never mind. I won't take a girl. We'll put it that way. Do you well, want to go no. to the football game? <laughs> well, I don't know. Dear, I'd love to go, but you know that I don't understand one thing about the game. All I know is a man stands up, he chases along with a ball under his arm, and I can never see who's got the ball. They're shoving it around, they're pushing it around, and then the man gets at the end, of, and by the time I see it, somebody in front of me stood up, my hat is off, their hat is I never see, darling, what's going on. I really don't. I suppose that women should be kept out of football games. No, I really darling, I disagree with you. But if I did it from a woman's point of view, there now, now you'd have some. Oh, I can just see myself announcing <laughs> a football game from a woman's angle. I suppose it would go something like this. 
Joe Delft has the ball, and he's running around the woman in the red hat and the gray hat, and he's passed and he's down to the 15, to the 10, to the 5-yard line. He goes all the way down to the woman in the mink coat and the purple crocheted beret. Oh, well, you <laughs> That's may... Well, dear, that, you know, that wouldn't be a bad idea, but speaking of berets, I was in John Frederick's the other day, and he had a crocheted beret that was simply divine. It was only, uh, oh, maybe $60. I don't remember. Oh, I don't look here. I know you can't afford it, but I know. Yes, yes, here we are. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful fun? Talking, but eat right? your eggs, sweetheart. And talking about this hat, you know, it comes way down over the hair, hairline and way over the ears. And I saw Lana Turner in it, dear. And I know that I wouldn't look like Lana Turner. You know that. Well, I'm but not interested in the crochet beret. But I could certainly like to see Lana Turner any time with or without a hat. But I can say one thing about women's hats. They never look out of style or go out of style. They just go on looking more ridiculous year in year. Oh, no, dear, listen, we saw a picture the other night, the Jolson story, that you loved the hat and that you simply adored, and you said, I wish you'd wear one like that. Well, you that remember? one looks good in almost anything, as far as I'm concerned. But speaking of that picture, brother, there is a picture that I can recommend to anybody. When I sat and watched that picture, I'm telling you, it just gave me a big thrill. I can't remember when I saw a picture and got chills on my back like I did the Jolson story, because I can remember when I was a kid seeing Jolie at the Paramount and sitting through six shows. I used to sit through six shows and Dear, watch Yeah, how perform. could you? You're not that... I, mean, I thought this was the second well, era of this thing. Well, Jolson's not that old, or oh, maybe my father told me about it. I can't oh, remember. Oh, I'm so glad you told anyway, me Anyway, I can remember <laughs> Jolie, and when I saw Larry Park play that part, after he'd been on the screen for two reels, I didn't realize that Jolson wasn't there. Because, of course, you know, they dubbed Jolson's voice all the way oh, through no, the picture. Oh, no, I didn't know picture. that. They yeah. did, and he did a beautiful job. And Park imitated Jolson all the way. He used all the gestures, and it went through a beautiful story. And, incidentally, it's in color. And I've never seen Technicolor done better, because you watch the whole picture, and you never get conscious that it's in color, and it was beautifully done. I say to Sidney Skolsky and Al Green, who directed it, did a swell job. I, I can't recommend that picture too too much for anybody that wants to see a lot of entertainment. Here's some beautiful songs that make you remember Al when he sang uh, such songs as Sonny Boy and all those songs that he sang. The one I hear days. you singing Mother. once in a while in the bus. Yeah, well, right? I'm not quite as good. I mean, I need a little more I'm fresh. I'm too modest, dear. That's right. That's <laughs> Tell that's me, uh, I mean. do you think it looks like it could be an Academy Award winner? The uh, Jolson story, I definitely do, and uh, it, it, it's a great picture. I only wish they were going to play it up here in Buddy Adler's hitching post that's going to open up here, you know. Say, hey, aren't we going to take the children to that? That children? I like them myself, but the kids love cowboy pictures. And, Michael, you like them if they've got cars in them, don't you? Yeah. That's right, of course. Yeah. He wants cars in them. But this is a new theater opening here in Beverly Hills on Cannon Drive. It's a... They're going to show all Western pictures and oh, really? turtles, of course. And I might as well get a plug in. Republic makes the best pictures, you know, out of our studio, of course. And I'm looking forward to that. The 23rd of this month. And that's an easy day to remember because it's the same day that USC plays UCLA for the right to go into the Rose Bowl. So that ought to be pretty good. Well, you're pretty excited about that game. Say, by the way, dear, last night when you were in the bathtub, May Sunday called you. Oh, well, I'll call her back later, dear. But speaking of bathtubs, I have Who a... Was? Uh, well, no, well, I've got an okay. idea, dear. I've got a new thing. It's an invention, you know? You know, you sit in the bathtub and you have uh, a tray sits in front of you, see? So the girls sit in the bath and they grease their faces and they take off their makeup and uh, that. And the man sits and he shaves in the bathtub Not and you bring... Well, dear, a lot of people do. I'm you, quickly you. a shower man. Before then that. they bring the telephone to the bathroom and you listen on the telephone and then... Uh, you can do most anything sitting in the tub today. I have a new invention. I really have. It's very Go good. ahead. Really I'm ready. Good. Another invention. Well, it's, I think this is very good. So you, you get nice and warm and you're in the bath. Suddenly, you lean back. You know what happens? You yes. lean back. It hits you right in the back. You get freezing cold. The ba back of the bath will be so cold. You get so cold. So I thought of a new thing. You know, they have heated pads and heat this and you heat that. And I thought, why couldn't we get an invention that heated up the back of the bathtub? Isn't that good? Oh, you got something there. I think I better talk to Don Amici. You know, he's working on our lot in the picture that Frank Brzezegi's doing, Gallant Man. And, of course, Amici, with all of his inventions, I'm sure he'll be able to work out a heated bathtub back. Now, how practical can you get with your inventions, dear? I think it's wonderful. Say, incidentally, speaking of inventions and uh, things like that, what happened to the Polish art treasures? 
Tresses? Yeah, but I got a slight <laughs> Who was on at 12.30 last night, <laughs> you or me? Well, slightly. I think that is an interesting subject, and I looked it up a little more after reading it in Newsweek last week. And as you remember, I told you that when the Nazis overran Poland in 1939, the Polish government... Uh, help her a little bit. Yeah, I'll give her a little milk. Much. Give her a little milk. What kind of milk? you got to mention that. Well, adorable. Adorable, adorable milk. Adorable milk. Don't that. you always drink That's adorable right. milk, darling? You eh? like Ador milk, Rock? Well, sure. They are yes, sweet. Yes, of course. There you go. She's got something That'll in her throat. That's all. Something in her throat is yeah. a little ticklish. But speaking of these uh, art treasures, when the Polish government uh, decided that the Nazis were coming in there in 1939, they shipped a lot of their treasures and $17 million in gold bullion and sent it into Canada. And when it got into Canada, the Canadian government uh, put it away as they would in a peacetime or on a peacetime basis. And they put it in three different places. They divided the treasures into three different sections and sent one-third of it in the Bank of Montreal. And then they put a third of it in a convent or a church, and it was called the saint anne de beaupre I hope that's right. Eileen, I suppose, will check me up on that. I think you've a... got a wonderful accent, dear. Oh, you, terrific. You're so now, that's Tony, that famous really. shrine, you know, dear. Oh, and yes, then, that's right. And then the third parcel uh, went to the Precious Blood Convent, and that's up in Ottawa, Canada. And I remember in May of this year that the Polish government representative called on the Precious Blood Convent, that's the third place they sent these treasures, and inquired about the trunks that contained these treasures, and he was told that the trunks had been claimed for well, three or four days before that, and that a man gave the nuns the secret password, and he signed a receipt. You see, they had a secret password for each one of these places where they had these treasures stored away. Mm -hmm. The man had to give them. Well, so the Polish representative went away. In the next few days, the mystery became even more mystifying because the high Canadian church officials said that the treasures were safe and they'd be held until the Polish government could prove rightful ownership. Now, the other church officials said that they knew nothing about them at all, and uh, Prime Minister Mackenzie King declared that the whole thing was of no concern to the Canadian government but was a private matter. But in London, the Polish embassy said that they held the Canadian government responsible under the Potsdam Agreement. But on the other hand, a Canadian spokesman said that the Canadian government didn't even sign the Potsdam Agreement. So it's quite involved, but it's intriguing, and I know a lot of uh, women are wondering what happened to the treasures. But I suppose that uh, Warner Brothers will make a picture with Humphrey Bogart and Baby Bacall one of these days and solve the mystery and let all the people know well, what happened. Exactly what happened. The, the cartoon of, oh, was very clever. Oh, I yes, I remember that cartoon. It was really terrific. There was a picture of a man who looked something like Stalin, and he had on his sleeve the uh, Russo element of the Polish government, and he had a big mustache like Stalin, and there was a big empty box, like a treasure box, and the door was open, and on the door was a sign that was stuck on there with a nail which said, Kilroyski was here. <laughs> and, of course, uh, our friend Kilroyski gets around a lot, and that was the cartoon I got a kick out of. I'm sure that a lot of the folks will be interested in that article that appeared in Newsweek, and I hope that solved your problem about the Polish mysteries. Of course, I'm the well-informed man of the day, so if there are any more Oh, you questions, always are, well, dear. You know, the ahead. head of the house always is. Yes, Tell me, darling, right. sometime or the other, I'm sure a lot of our listeners don't know about Kilroy. A lot of them do. So one day, will you go into it and tell them all about the Kilroy? Well, let's do it on a Sunday because I, we're not on the air that day, and I'll tell everybody exactly. <laughs> that's where Kilroy is. You but see, the day we go off the air, thing. Kilroy broadcasts, <laughs> and that's why they don't hear him. What are you having there? Some nice, crisp, sunny-side bacon rock? That's what it looks like you're eating. Isn't it wonderful? I had some myself in these scrambled eggs, and, and this bread, this toast, you know, is made from Helm's bread. Michael, do you know the Helms baker that comes and toots the whistle in the morning? Well, he, he's a very nice boy. Michelle does, don't you, Michelle? What are you eating, Michelle? Bacon and some bread. What sort of bacon are you eating, do you know? Huh? You don't know? What do you usually eat? What's that the cereal that you eat, darling? What, huh? what do you have? What do you like for breakfast, Michelle? Wheaties and crackers. Wheaties, the breakfast of champions? Do you oh, really? Isn't that wonderful? Well, you like another kind, don't you, Ross? What do you like? Cheerios? Cheerios. Oh, Cheerios. they're good, well, too. Well, we have to get those I should in. say so. Yeah, um... What are they going to have for dinner, by the way? Yes, what are they eating tonight, Mrs. Leonard, you know? Yeah. Liver and spinach. Liver and spinach. Would you like liver and spinach? Oh, wonderful. Yeah, well, as long as we're talking about liver, dear... Yes? Let's not have liver again for me. You know, I never eat it, and I don't like it, and I don't want any part of it. 
Well, see, I'm terribly sorry. That was a mistake. I've only been married to you ten years. How do you expect me to know by this time what you like and what you don't like? Well, you ought to know I don't like liver. Well, I'll get used to you in time, dear. It just takes a little while. You know well, how it is. Well, about ten more years, and you might get used to me. Or how long does a man have to be married to a woman before she knows him? Maybe I ought to ask Eddie Cantor, and he can tell me. Unless he tells me that all his wife will tell him is that she can have girls and not boys. <laughs> or something like that. So, uh, they're wonderful shirts you've got on the babies today. Those, those Matrix T-shirts? Yes, they are. Oh, they're wonderful. You know, I wish you'd get one for me. I think we can do. I think Matrix make them now for men. Because they're the only shirts I really know that you can put in the rush tub. And they don't run at all. This is absolutely, I've tried all of them. Can you get them big enough for a man? Oh, I think you can. I think all, most all local stores sell natives. So they're the all best, right. absolutely the best on the market, darling. I could probably get a lot of boys that would want some of those T-shirts. You know, they're tough to get. I've been out of the Army long enough now, so I've worn out all my Army T-shirts that the government provides. Well, me. when I go out to the store today, I'll see if I can get one for you, because I've got to go shopping. What are you going to do today? I'm going to buy way? some shoes here. Shoes? Uh-huh. Where? On Camden Drive, right above us here. Do you know the, who's opened it? Murray's. Murray's uh, shoe store. Oh, they're simply designed. Didn't you hear about it? Shoes again? What are you going to do with all those shoes you got upstairs? Well, they hurt me, dear. I've never seen this to fail yet. Every woman has a slew of shoes in the closet. She always wants to buy new shoes, and they always hurt her. Why don't they buy them to fit her? Well, dear, you always think you do, but you walk and you get hot and your feet get tired, and that's why I brought some of that powder the other day, you know. And it's going to cost more money for shoes. Well, I have to buy... Oh, he's got the most beautiful shoes, really, dear. They're so beautiful. The colorings are wonderful, and he has bags to match. It really is a wonderful... And it's so comfortable. It's a modern store, and you really sit down, and you don't... You're going to buy one pair, so you wind up buying three or four because it's so comfortable in the yes, place. and when the 15th of March comes around, Uncle Sam says, we can't deduct those shoes from your income tax, and I get the bills, and we scream and holler and... But they must be good if they you like them. They are, You know where I heard about them? No, dear, where? At uh, Dolores Hope Shire the other day. Oh, that must have been true. Oh, it was wonderful. I went there, and uh, you know she's adopted two little children. I didn't know that. It's one of the little, little boy's name is Kelly Hope. Isn't that a cute name? Kelly Hope. How do you like that? I can see Bing Crosby now signing him up already for Notre Dame or Gonzaga University. Uh, Kelly Hope. Oh, he's the cutest little thing you've ever seen. There's about 60 girls there. And Cass Daly was there. She sang. Oh, she's such a good entertainer. Oh, she's entertainer. great entertainer. Wonderful. She was so cute. She had on a green wool dress. It looked like one of Adrian's. I don't know, but that's what it looked like. It was so cute. And Dolores, I think, had on... I think she had one of his on also. It was a black taffeta, three-quarter length, and the skirt was tight-fitting. And she had a little black cloak. She looked like a 1928 hat with a, with a little veil on it. It was the sweetest thing I've ever seen. She really looked lovely. She must have looked And uh, Dixie Lee was there, and she sang. That's and she had... Thing crossed. Oh, yes, I beg your pardon. She was dead. She had on a lynx coat, three-quarter lynx, lynx coat. And uh, she sang a couple of songs, and if you shut your eyes, she sounded exactly like Bing. I've never heard anything quite like it. She was so cute. We better mention that to Philco the next time we see Mr. Philco. <laughs> okay. Oh, and i tell you who else I saw that. You remember Kay St. Germain? I certainly do. She used to be uh, uh, Jack Carson. What do you mean, used to be? I saw them at the football game last Sunday, and they're as happy as they can be. Haven't you heard? Let me give you the gossip, Mrs. Uh, Parsons, or whatever your name is. Uh, Kay and Jack are back together again and very happy. Doesn't that make you happy? Oh, I couldn't be happier, dear. That's simply wonderful, because they're such a nice couple. Have you ever heard her sing? Oh, have I heard her sing? I'll bet you can't remember what program she used to sing on. No. $64, if you guess. Oh, dear, I need to I just gave the man's but... name a little while ago, and he, he has five daughters. I know. Ken, Oh, wonderful. Give the lady $64. <laughs> okay, dear. So, and one of the girls were telling me that they were going to New York on, on the plane, and they said there was something about 186 passengers plane. Well, that doesn't seem possible. 180 passengers. Oh, 80 is fine. It not only is possible, but it's factual, my dear. They've already made a trip with an airplane that carries 180 passengers, and it's a beautiful thing. It's a double-deck airplane, and it's got a spiral staircase in the front, spiral staircase in the back, and it's got four big 1,200 horsepower engines, and you walk out into the wing, and you can actually walk clear out to the wing tips, and there are windows out there where you can look around, a lounge room, a smoking room, and everything. It's a beautiful layout. You walk out into the wing? That's right. I would be quite upset. Well, that's nothing. They're going to have bigger airplanes than that one these days. There's something about a 400 plane. Is that right? Well, don't you remember I went down to Long Beach about 
Oh, uh, about three weeks ago Sunday and saw that airplane that Howard Hughes is building. Oh, yes. Is that They're building the airplane right from scratch, right over the water. And they're going to take it off. It's an amphib. Yes. They're going to take it off in the water. It's going to carry 400 people. It's going to be a three-decker with six engines and twin tail elements. And it's going to be a 400-passenger airplane. It'll take you from here to Honolulu, 400 people, and come back the next day for breakfast and take 400 more over. In that short of time? In that short of How time. How many? Well, they, go they, to, they go to Honolulu now in 12 or 13 hours. I used to take an airplane, a C-54, over to Hickam Field in 12 and a half, 13 hours during the war. And really? this airplane will go over there in about eight hours or Isn't seven and a half right? hours. It'll be nothing. But, well, of course, I like the romance of a five-day trip on the boat. And I've yeah. been told that if this airplane uh, doesn't work out, they're going to cut the wind off of it and make a liner out of it. Do you, you want to be excused, please, huh? Okay, we'll excuse Peter, won't we, everybody? Okay, we'll see you later. Where are you going, Peter? He's, uh, where are you going, Peter? He's going to do his chores there, he said. Oh, yes, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. What, do you have milk? Yeah, he can in a moment or two. What does he, he want, Michelle? He wants his milk. His milk? Okay. He'll get it in a moment. He's going to get it himself. Then. Yeah. Peter, speaking of, uh, we, we've got to go out tonight. Where shall we eat? I hear that uh, Chico Moxie's place is simply wonderful. Oh, yes, at that bridge game last night, we were talking about the Grill and griddle, they call it. Isn't that a peculiar name? No, I think it's a cute name. Do you? Yes. I think it's, it's a little tough to remember. What's yeah. that? Peter's going to get his milk. Yeah, Peter's going to get his milk. Yeah, she'll come back in a minute and get it, dear. But last night when I was in this bridge game, dear, uh, Chico was talking about his place, and George Rush said he had eaten dinner there. And he had a wonderful steak and nice shrimp cocktail, and very reasonable, much more yeah. reasonable than most places. He's a better deal. We're going with all our children. And it was a delicious New York cut steak, and... Enjoyed the meal, and it's located right up where Tips used to be. You know, right? Yeah. Well, you know, at the corner of Santa Monica and Wilshire, where they come together there. It's just about next door a... to the Ralph Market, you mean? That's right. Oh, I know. That's sure. right. That's where you do your shopping. Oh, that's shopping. very central, isn't it? Get right off the bus. That's right. Oh, that's wonderful. That's Ralph Market. That's where the man wouldn't give you any black market products, or you wouldn't buy them. Which was it? I wouldn't or... buy them, oh, dear. That's right. Mr. That's Stewart. right. How long have you been a citizen now? Ten years. Well, ten years. <laughs> well, I wonder what all those relatives in England are thinking about. How many do you have over there? By oh, the way? I have one sister that now has. She's got 12 children. Listen, dear, don't get encouraged about this. Why should we talk about it? How many were, were there in your family? Uh, 16. Well, I have hopes. We have three now. Would you like about eight brothers, Michael? No, he wouldn't, dear. So leave us cut that out right now. <laughs> you know, isn't it time you uh, got going to work? Yes, I better go to the work. I have to fight my way through that picket line out there. Uh-huh. So, incidentally, uh, what is happening about this strike? I don't understand it, and I'm sure that most of our listeners don't. I wish you'd explain it to me a little bit. Well, it's, it's a very difficult thing to explain entirely because most people who read about it all, all hear that it's a jurisdictional strike. And what it evolves down to in simple language is that there are two unions. One is the CSU Conference of Studio Union, and the other one is the IATSE. And these two unions are fighting for the right to see which which union is going to build the sets and tear them down? In studio language, we call them erecting and striking a set. Now, one union wants to build them, and the other one strike them. But they won't strike them unless their own union builds them. So there's a big battle as to who's going to build them and strike them, and it's been going back and forth. The producers themselves in the studio has nothing to do with it. They don't know who wants to build them, and they don't know how they're going to settle it. But inasmuch as both the CSU and the IATSC are both members of the American Federation of Labor, the studios are hoping that the AF of L will solve the problem and make a decision on it. Anyway, we're not getting any place with it. It costs the studios a lot of money, and more important, it costs a lot of working men, carpenters and prop men and everything else, a lot of time, and the families who really need it are not working. So it's a pretty tough thing to solve, and I'm going to stay as uh, neutral as I possibly can on it. Well, tell me something. Do you mean that one union is fighting another union? That's exactly right, dear. And they, that they can't settle it in any way? That's right. So it they... seems a terrible way to, to, to well, go about anything. they're trying to work out an arbitration committee now, and my goodness, what time is it? It's 8.45 right now, and I think it's the... Darling, you, uh, you know what a nun said? The trouble with a husband who works like a horse is that all he wants to do in the, in the evening is hit the hay. A nun hit the hay? Listen, Anon didn't know who Frankovich was, and who is Anon, anyway? You know, darling, Anon, for anonymous. Oh, my goodness, darling. Those are the kind of things no red-blooded man should have to put up with in the morning, at this time of the morning, especially. That remember?
reminds that reminds me. Do you uh, you know the sophisticated sheep that said blah? Oh my goodness! And that remembers instead of that. Remembers, <laughs> that well, it's a little early. I'm morning, warning you, Penny. I'm yes, warning you. All right, all right. But I thought it was cute. Yes, darling. Yes, Peter came back. Right. Sit down, Peter. He's going to have his milk now. What he's going to do. Go ahead. All right, darling. You better get on your way. I'm going to get on my way, but before I do, I might tell the children, the next time you cough like that, Michael, you put your hands up to your mouth. You understand that? Well, he didn't do it that time, Michelle. What's the matter, Rocky? You got something in your throat? Have you? Oh, dear. Well, pat, pat hey, him on the back, Daddy. Pat him on the back. By the way, I didn't tell you last night when I was coming from the studio, I listened to Bob Trout for a while, and he was telling us about a youngster who was riding a streetcar, yeah. and he saw a woman... You better give him a little milk, there's joking. Okay. Well, let's hope he doesn't show up right There's here. a telephone. Yeah. Amy, now answer the yeah. telephone. All right. And Bob Trout was telling about this little boy who was watching this woman on the streetcar, and she was chewing bubble gum, and just chewing away on bubble gum, and he looked up at his mommy, and he says, Mommy... You see, those are the kind of people that are causing shortage to people like me. And that was right on the Bob Trout show last night. Another thing he talked about, which intrigued me somewhat, was the uh, elections that we had, the recent elections. You know, they, they can talk about elections year in and year out. Yeah. He was telling about the Greeks couldn't figure out who won the election in the United States, and he thought we were all crazy. Because in uh, Greek, or in the Greek language, democratis means both Republican and Democrats. Yeah. And so they couldn't figure out whether the Democrats won the election or the Republicans won the election. Mm -hmm. So the news came over that the Democrats had been replaced by the Republicans in all the important offices in the states here. So they started to look it up in their Democratic, in their Democratic uh, uh, language as well as in their Greek dictionaries. Yeah. And so the Greek dictionaries showed that Democrat meant both Republican and Democratic. Mm -hmm. Well, you see, our derivative is the Latin for Republican, but we got Democrat from the Greek Democratus. What did you say, Rocky? He wants milk to the top of his glass. He said it was filled with top. Adore milk, and he loves it so much, don't you, darling? Yes. Yeah. You going to school this morning? No. You're not, not going to school. Why not? not? Hmm? Because we have a cold. Yeah, have a cold. Incidentally, they've got to go to the doctors and get some shots for those colds. Well, they had some sh booster shots today. Yeah, they've got to get cold shots, dear, because that's the only way to keep colds from them all winter. Really, there's a new thing out, and it's simply wonderful for them. There is? Mm-hmm. Will you take them up on your way to work and drop them off at the doctor's office for me? All right. Uh, what, what did the doctor do today when he gave you that shot, Rock? Mm -hmm. what, what did he do? You know, Michelle? I said it. Well, he what, did what? What, what did he do? A shot. He shot you? He did. How did he do it? He just took something and put it in your arm like that? Did it hurt you, darling? It didn't. Didn't? Did you cry, Rock? No. You don't cry, is that right? Well, he's a big boy. That's why he doesn't Are cry. Are you going to school, Michelle? No. You're not? No. Well, if you have to go to school, what's the first thing the teacher makes you do? Does she make you do Pledge of Allegiance? You don't know how to do it. Yes, I do. Well, let me hear you say it. Daddy, you should have left of America. Oh, well, that's very good. Everybody very applaud. Good. Rock, you have to clap for your sister. Could that's you, very good. Very good. Could you very sing uh, uh, this morning? Could you sing uh, 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 God Bless America? I don't think she knows it. God Bless America. To the light, light will fall from the mountain. To the prairie. To the prairie. To the ocean. To the ocean. Oh, to the media. 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 To the that's okay. Very good. Well, dear, as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to the studio. I'm getting all primed for that game because most of this week I'm going to be worrying about that USC UCLA game. And I know that all the people listening in will be worrying about it. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to pull for the Bruins. But it looks like it's going to be a rugged game because the Trojans have come along very fast and it should be about even money at game time on Saturday. Well, that's about all there is to it. I'd like to leave all our listeners with a good thought. And here it is. Enjoy.
enjoy yourself. It's later than you think. See you tomorrow. Bye, everyone.